Hey guys, it's your favorite book, book reading ginger, sorry, and welcome to my book club. So we are finishing our book, A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Mass, and I'm super excited. The ending of the book was so good, and I hope you enjoyed it too. So I decided we'd have a little pajama party. So if you want to take a PJ in your selfies and post it on Instagram, tag me in it at the book reading ginger. I would love to see your PJ, PJ pictures. And I also, if you follow me on Instagram, you heard me talking about a book giveaway. Yeah. So I am giving away uh, two copies. So there's going to be two winners of the paperback copy of A Court of Wings and Ruin. It's the third book in the trilogy that we're reading right now. So when we get, so when we get to the third book, you'll already have it. Um, so all you have to do to win is answer one little question. It's not very hard. Um, and you're going to answer it by commenting uh, below. If you miss the live stream, you have up till Christmas Day, December 25th, to comment below and uh, have a chance to win. And then on December 26th, I will announce our winners. So you'll have to catch the live stream for that. And then, of course, I will give you instructions on how to get the books. So the question is, what was the first compliment Tamlin gave Farah? It was not too long after she arrived, so that's all the hints I'm going to give you. So if you think you know it, comment below. And if you like this video, I can maybe give you a double entry. So maybe that would be a little uh, enticement to like my video. <laughs> so if you comment below between now and December 25th, you'll be entered to win uh, if, you answer question, if you answer the question correctly. And the question was, what was the first comment or first compliment that Tamlin gave Farah, and I'll repeat it again at the end of the live stream. So I think that's all I have for now. We're gonna jump right into our book. Um, so I'm just gonna give a recap. You know, we start out with the our main character is Farah. She killed the wolf. The wolf was a fairy. Uh, the beast broke down our door and was like, "You can live with me, or I can kill you." She picked to live with them. The beast turned out to be Tamlin. Tamlin was the high court, a uh, high lord of the spring court. That's where she's been staying at. And of course, I fell in love. And when things got messy, he ended up sending her back home to the mortal realm. So that's where we're at. Fair is back in the mortal realm with her sisters and her family. And um, they they threw like a little party for her to welcome her back home. And she hears about the Bordera's family, their home how it was burnt to the ground and Claire, the, the girl in the home, her body was missing and she kind of goes into a panic because if you remember, that's the name that she gave Rysand or Rysand, whatever his name is. She gave him um, in place of her name. So, so her body is, her house was burnt down and her body's missing and she knows something is wrong. So she's like, I'm going back. So, if you remember from last time, the glamour didn't work on Nesta. So, she tells Nesta, she's like, you have to keep my secret, you know, you have to keep the secret, take care of the family, I've got to go back. So, she goes. And, um, right before she leaves, uh, Elaine's waiting for her and Elaine is like in tears and she's sobbing. Elaine's her other sister. She says, I remember everything. I remember so, I'm also curious if her father remembers. Her father wasn't around when she left. So, I was just, you know, he may have been, like, maybe if he remembers, he was ashamed of the way he was. You know, he didn't take care of his family. So, I just kind of wonder what's up with that. Uh, but he wasn't there. So, Nesta and Elaine, we know both now remember what happened in the beginning when the beast broke down the door, which was actually Tamlin. So, she heads back. Uh, her, the mansion is empty and she walks inside and it's absolutely destroyed um the there's nobody there she's walking around looking she's calling tamlin's name um we find out alice for some reason that her little servant was actually still there and you know she tells her what happened and we find out that um the curse or the blight is actually a curse uh that was cast by aramatha and it was all because she was mad because her sister fell in love with a human soldier named Jurian. And he's, it was the cause of her death. 
and she didn't like that and it was back during the wars it was a while back and so she made her this palace under this under the mountain was what it's called and that's where she made her palace at and then you know this is 40 almost 50 years ago she invites tamlin and all of his court to a party and they wear the mask in honor of um in honor and that's when she took some of his power and all of the high lords some of their power and um you know trapped several of them under the mountain with her and apparently um part of the curse was he couldn't tell anybody about it um and she the, the to break the curse he had to make a human fall in love with him who had who hated fairies which was Fera, and she did but the um the trick to that you know they put the mask she thought the mask would be funny because you know humans are so vain and all that so but he couldn't tell her about it and since Fera never officially said i love you back to tamlin it didn't work so they're trapped under the mountain and she tells Alice, she's like, can you take me there? And she's like, it's a death wish. You shouldn't go. And she's like, I'm going. So she goes. Um, she doesn't get very far in, of course, until the otter finds her and takes her to Aramatha. And so we finally meet her. We finally get to see her. We've heard so much about her and uh, her cruelness. But now we finally get to see her. And she is beautiful, of course. She's Faye. Um, so, and she's sitting on a throne. And right beside her throne is Tamlin. And... Fair is just heartbroken because there he is. He's sitting there. He's not showing much emotion, um, of course. And in order to apparently, and then also in the throne room, we see Claire's body. She's been brutally. She was brutally hurt, and her body was burned, and it was just hanging in the room, throne room. It was awful. You can really see how cruel this queen thinks she or she is not think she is I mean she's very cruel and in order to welcome Farrah to her court she beats her to a bloody pulp and sends her to you know like that's her welcome but anyway they uh she's trying to figure out how to get out of this and she gives her or Amethyst gives her this this option she's like I'm gonna give you three tasks to complete and I will free you or I'll give you a riddle and you will be instantly freed if you can answer the riddle. And I'm actually going to read y'all the riddle because I I actually like shut the book and thought of, on this riddle for a while and I couldn't even figure out the answer. But the riddle was, those who seek me a lifetime but we never meet, and those I kiss but who trample me beneath ungrateful feet. At times, I seem to favor the clever and the fair but I bless all those who are brave enough to dare. By large, my ministrations are soft-handed and sweet, but scorned, I become a difficult beast to defeat. For each of my strikes lends a powerful blow. When I kill, I do it slow. So even like when I was just sitting there reading that, I was like, what, what, what does this, like, what does this mean? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't even know what this means. Um, I couldn't even figure it out. So I was like, oh, this is not, this is not easy. So she gives her these three tasks or, you know, she gives her the riddle and she's like, whichever one. So, and like I say, um, she gets over to a bloody pulp, sends her back to her cell. So the first task is this giant worm and they throw Farrah into their trap, into its like layer or whatever. So when I was thinking about this worm, I was thinking like, the big, I don't know if y'all remember this or know this, but that big ugly pink worm from Spongebob. Does anybody, like, do y'all know what I'm talking about? That worm. You know, it's it's not pretty. It's, you know, it's a big pink ugly worm. I was thinking that. Well, there was this thing on the internet I saw where they were like, this is what it actually looks like. Guys, this is what it actually looks like. That thing is scary as hell. Like, that's a lot more scarier than what I was picturing. I was picturing while I'm reading this, I was like, oh, it's a little big giant pink worm and it's chasing her around. No, she's getting chased by this thing. Like, that thing is scary as hell. Like, I would be terrified. I mean, not to say that a giant pink worm wouldn't be scary, but it's a lot less scarier looking than what the actual one looks like. Like, that thing is scary. So she uh, is like pushed down into its pit and I guess she has to like defeat it or whatever. So, um, she ends up, like, getting smart and realizing that it's blind. 
So she covers herself in mud to mask her scent, which is really smart, and makes like, I guess because they feed it people, <laughs> she finds the bones and she like stabs them to the ground and makes like a pit where it like, it, when it chases her, it impels itself on the bones. And that's what she did. She got it to chase her and then moved out of the way and it impelled itself on the bones and died. Well, when she jumped out of the way, um, from my understanding, like a piece of bone, like cut her arm and hurt her arm pretty badly but she fought through it she got up on there and was like i defeat the worm she like splashed mud on a thorn with this white dress and was like yeah bitch i did it and it was really good but she did hurt her arm so later in her cell she's talking about like she knows it's not good her arm is getting infected she's got fever she's pretty much dying because of this infection that has set up in her arm from being in that mud and filth and probably worm poop. So, Ryson, of course, saunters in. He doesn't walk in. He saunters in. Um, and he's like, I can fix your arm, but it's going to come at a price. So, she bargains with him. Like, she's, I mean, like, she's dying and she's sitting here trying to bargain because he wants her to spend time at the night court. So, what they agree on is a week every month at the night court. And he's like, done. He heals her. She looks. She's got this tattoo, guys, going from, like, her fingertips. I'm thinking, like, to her elbow. Um, like, this long tattoo. And he's like, yeah, it's customary in my court for uh, bargains to be marked upon the flesh. I'm like, well, that would have been nice to know before I got this cool tattoo. And it's got, like, an eye in the middle. Um, if you ever check out anybody that does, like, cosplay... Oh my gosh, some of them do like some amazing tattoos when they cosplay Farrah. Like, I love it. Um, the designs are so beautiful that they come up with. And of course, um, the cover of the next book, um, Mr. A Court of Mr. Fury, actually has her tattooed like arm on the cover. So it's really cool. You can kind of see it. It's actually a kind of cool tattoo. Like, if I had to pick something to be tattooed upon my arm, I'd pick that. That'd be pretty cool. So, um,. So, anyway, she gets this tattoo out of their bargain, and uh, while she's there, uh, the, the guards are, like, or, or Ramoth is, like, making her earn her keep. So, the guards push her in this room, and they say, there's all these lentils in the ash. You must clean them before the occupant gets back in here. So, she's trying to, like, get all these itty bitty lentils out of a pile of ash out of the fire, in, like, in the fireplace. And the occupant of the room arrives, and it's Rysan, and, um... You know, she's talking to him, like, can you help me? And he was like, you know what? For having the balls to ask, I'll do this for you. And he, like, makes all the lentils appear into a bucket. And um, she starts talking about the power. And he actually shows her that, you know, his power has been diminished, too. He just had a really strong power. And he actually shows some of her, his beastly side. Like, he has these big wings. Like, they look like bat wings that he just made appear and then like he has talons where his feet should be so he has but like that's his beastier side um so she um sorry I lost my train of thought but anyway so he shows her his you know a little bit of his beast form the big wings and stuff and when he calls the guards back in there he's like hey don't make her do any more of these chores and if you harm her you turn your daggers into yourself and kill yourself and that's kind of, you know, he glamoured their minds and, you know, made them think. So, she didn't have to do any more, like, mundane chores after this. So, that was good. So, well, then, Rison's night court servants come and get her one night. Without saying a word, they strip her, wash her, and paint her body. Um, so, and they put, like, on this, like, very thin fabric that just barely covers anything. And he sends her out there, and he gives her the wine to drink. She drinks it, and apparently we find out later um, when Lucian shows up that, like, she dances for him, and she sits in his lap and all this. And she can't remember because she drank the fairy wine. And this goes on for, like, several nights. She, she just becomes, like, his plaything. Um, you know, like, she, he, her, her servants come, they paint her body, they dress her in these itsy teeny weeny outfits that barely cover anything and she goes out there and she drinks the wine and this is just like a nightly occurrence because I guess they're always having parties in the throne room. Um, so that's a little strange. So the second task comes and all I can imagine is that she's in a room and like she can see 
Lucian, but she can't get to him. And he's like over there climbed to a ch like tied to a chair. And this grate's in the ceiling and it's got spikes on it and it's coming down and she has to choose the right lever to stop the grate from coming down or they're all going to be like smush. Well, there's, um, there's an inscription like above the levers, I guess, to help her choose what lever, lever to pick. But guess what? If you don't remember from earlier in the book, Farrah can't read. <laughs> So there's this inscription and she has no clue what to do and she's like panicking because she's like, oh my gosh, I can't read and I'm going to get us killed. Like this is going to happen. Like I'm going to get us killed. So she goes to like pull the, um, the second lever but like this pain shot up her arm. And then she goes for the first lever and then she, that pain shoots up her arm again. And so she goes through the third lever and she pulls that one and of course it stops the spikes. Well, the pain shooting up her arm, I obviously probably assumed it was Rysan, and we find out later, you know, it was, because he realized you can't read, and you almost got us all killed, so he, like, sh like as she reached for those levers, he shot that pain to her arm, so she went and pulled it. She would pull the third one where there was no pain, and stop the spikes from impaling them, and her, well, her and Lucian, because Lucian's life was on the line, too. It wasn't just hers. Um, so she's in her, she gets out, she's very upset, and Ryzen's like telling her in her mind, don't let her see you cry, you know, look her in the eye, count to three, go back to your cell. So she goes back to her cell, she's so angry, she's crying because she couldn't read and almost got her and Lucian killed. So Ryzen comes to her cell and licks the tears away, which is so weird, but she stops crying and is like, ha. I knew that would get you to stop. And, you know, it's just really strange. But she does admit, Fair admits that, like, he kept her from completely shattering. You know, that helped her stay together to get, to get, you know, to survive. We have to survive this. This is all of our lives depend. we got to get out of this mountain. So, he helped her a little bit. And he didn't even realize it. So, then we get to, um, where, well... They're going, they're back in the throne room, and this is on page 381, and it's Ryson talking about he just wants a moment of peace, um, and he's talking about he wants a moment of peace from all those people that call him, you know, he's like, I'm, you know, he's like, you, if you hate me, you must imagine how you'd feel if I made you serve in my bedroom every night. He's like, I'm a high lord of the night court, not her harlot, and of course, from early in the book, you remember he was called, you know, Amar with this whore. So, you know, those slurs are obviously true. He spends the night in her bedroom. And, you know, he's like, um, he's like, one wrong move and we're all doomed. And he's like, if you fail, she rules forever. And he doesn't want that. So, you know, Ryson's helping her because he doesn't want to be stuck under the mountain forever with her like he wants us to end he wants to go back to his court so you know he's he's doing it for himself you know not just her and of course um he does say that he likes to roll up tamlin um so but while they're talking we also find out um his father killed Tamlin's father and Tamlin's brothers. And he says a long story, so we don't really find out why his father killed them. Um, I would like to know why, so maybe we'll find that out later. But Rysan's father killed Tamlin's father and Tamlin's brothers. And we don't know how that happened or why it happened, but, you know, he did. Tamlin did tell Farrah earlier that his family was killed by an enemy court. So apparently the night court and spring court are not you know, simpatico at all. So, um, that means they don't get along, you know, they, they obviously don't get along. So, of course, I can see why he likes just rolling Tamlin up by making her dance for him and stuff and painting her body and all that good, all that good junk. So, the third task arrives and, oh, y'all, this tore me up. Like, this task was awful. Oh, my goodness. So, it's in the throne room, and they bring in these three fae, and they all have, like, sacks over their heads. You can't see who they are. And they sit them down, and they give her an ash dagger, and she has to kill them. And y'all, that tore me up. Like, this, she's so cruel. Like, that is, like, so wrong. 
So, and you know, Pharaoh's like, okay, I kill the, you know, and she's like, if you refuse, I'm killing you. So it's like, okay, I could die or I kill these three fae and we all live. And I mean, that's a big deal because you're taking like three lives. So she does it. Oh my gosh, she does it. They pull off the, you know, pull off the hood and like she stabs the first one in the heart with the ash dagger and I'm just like, oh my goodness. Like, and then she goes to the second one and I'm crying and Farrah's crying and I'm just like, oh my gosh, she's she's killing people. Oh, this is awful. They, um, they pull the sack off the third head and the third little fairy, you know, it's Tamlin. So, and Tamlin supposedly at this point, like when she walked in, Tamlin was supposed to be sitting by uh, her throne. So she looks up and the Tamlin sitting beside the throne turns into the otter. So that is the real Tamlin in front of her. Like, what is she going to do? And I was thinking like, but, I mean, the Bish Queen, she wants Tamlin. So I was just, like, my thought process was I'm assuming that she just figured Pharaoh wouldn't do it and she would just kill Pharaoh. But Pharaoh was a little bit smarter and she remembered talking about listening and that mate like the answer has been here all along and she talks about, you know, Alice told her to listen to keep her eyes open. And so this part she was talking about she's overheard things and one of the things that she two of the things she overheard was uh Tamlin and Lucian talking and Lucian said, For someone with a heart of stone, yours is certainly soft these days and then the otter talking Though you have a heart of stone, Tamlin, the otter said, you certainly keep it, keep a host of fear in 